Hey, this is the Sword and the Pen Reflections. It is my casual alternative to the more formal channel, the Sword and the Pen, link up there. So today I am reviewing the final episode of Shadow and Bone Season 1, Episode 8, and comparing it to its corresponding chapter in the book, Shadow and Bone, which would be basically chapters 22, chapters, just chapter 22. So my first impression is I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. There was a lot of problems with this last episode. Up until now, the show has done a, I would say that comparing the two as far as sophistication of the writing is concerned, the show has been better than the book. It was an improvement. Good job on Lee Bardugo for deciding to go ahead with those changes and guiding the writing team into, you know, fixing some of the problems with the book. But there were issues with this last episode and it, it, you know, the warning bells are going off in my head going, oh great, is this going to, you know, slowly deteriorate, especially as we get into season two? I don't know. But let's go over them. So very quickly, I wrote down my notes for what happens in chapter 22 and then I'll go over the stuff that happened in the show because uh, there were a lot of differences. So first of all, Zoya is not on the boat in the book. Um, the uh, Darkling calls the Volcra to the skiff, which I thought was odd. And then he makes Alina create a channel. So she wanted to, he wanted to like freak everybody out and then send them through. But then Ivan shoves Mal overboard because remember in the book, he's going to make Alina watch the Volcra eat Mal, which I thought was, I mean, he's clearly the villain. The Kerrigan is clearly the villain in the book. I mean, somebody described him in the comments as being the mustache twirler. Yeah, that, that's who he is in the book. And I, I, I love what they've done with him in the movie, which or in the show, which is make it so that the audience is kind of questioning just how bad he is. I mean, he does do some things that are seriously bad, but at the same time, I'm going, I see why he's doing it. You know, he says, this is how we will save the, the Grisha. This is how we will stop the wars. I get it. And he's, you know, just a control freak at this point. And, and obviously some power hunger has seeped into his need for control. But anyway, um, so in the book, Alina punches Ivan and then the Darkling forces Alina to put Mal in the darkness. So yeah, what happens was Ivan shoves Mal overboard and then the Darkling says, okay, Alina, now we're gonna take the this barrier of light and we're gonna shrink it so that Mal is off in the darkness. And so she can hear him screaming off in the darkness. I, <laughs> mustache twirling right there, right? And then here's something that happens in the book that I really, really like. Alina realizes that she has spared the life of the stag and because of that mercy, she was just as much in possession of the life of the stag as the Darkling was for killing it. And that's how she has her like realization like, oh wait, I am the one who possessed the stag. I'm the one who owned it or whatever. And so she, uh, that's where she gets her, her um, I don't know what you call it, her self-possession back, you know, cause the Darkling was in control of her. But in the book, it's like, oh, by being merciful, I own the stag's life as well. I could have killed it and wanted to, but didn't. That's not what they did in the show, and we'll get back to that. Also, Alina does the cut. She does the light version of the cut at this point. She she says she she did something like where it made her feel like she had possession of a sword and then sliced, and then she, she cut the mast of the skiff off. And I really like that. I like that she attained a new power when she had this discovery of I have possession of my power and I have possession of the amplifier through the stag because of the mercy thing. Then Alina jumps overboard and turns the lights out basically. And she kind of creates this bubble over herself and Mal and then they take off. They run away leaving, um, what's his name? Leaving Kerrigan and the diplomats and the other Grisha who are on board to kind of fend for themselves and she can hear them in the background. And I really, really liked that because it was a big moment for her to decide to abandon everybody who's on the skiff because, and her justification was, well, they didn't come to my aid when I asked them for help. Like she begged them to help her. Like, hey, the General Kierkegaard is a bad guy. And she could tell that they were upset with what he does, you know, spreading the fold out into Novokrebirsk. And um, was, you know, saying we got to fight against this and nobody came to her defense. So she's kind of like, you you had your chance. I'm outie, you know. I, yes, I said outie. <laughs> I grew up in the early 90s, so give me a break. See, I'm outie. Bye. After that, 
nothing that happens to Alina and Mal really is different from in the book, except that we've got the crows involved. So in the book, they, um, they, Mal goes into town and sells a gold pin that she had in her hair and buy some new clothes for her. And they decide they're going to get on a boat and they're going to go off, you know, somewhere overseas. I don't, I don't remember if it said exactly where they were going to go. I don't think they really even had a plan so much as they just decided the ocean is the place to go. So that's where we're going. And that's it. That's what happened in the book. Okay, now we're going to get to what happens on in this show. Uh, and again, I had to write down my notes. Like there was a lot going on that bugged me and I'm just going to go over them. So first of all, okay, I do like that Zoya is on the skiff with them because she's a great villain and I see where they're going with her. She's going to become the villain who, you know, joins, betrays her own and, and, and joins forces with Alina and those guys. But they didn't do it right. They, I like this idea, but they didn't do it right in the show. So right before they're going to kill off Nova Kribirsk. And this is, if I had not read the chapter, so I read the chapter before I watched the episode. If I had not read that chapter, I still would have guessed that the Darkling was going to attack Nova Kribirsk. Why? Because of this piece of dialogue where Zoya is talking to the heart render and says, the first thing I'm going to do when I get over there is I'm going to go and visit my aunt. And he's like, uh, you have family over there? And she's like, yep, that's why I volunteer for this job all the time. I mean, it couldn't be more obvious that they're setting her up to be somebody who does not like the idea of of Nova Kribirsk being destroyed or threatened or hurt in any way. So it was really obvious to me, and I feel like they should have mentioned this sooner in the series. And it wouldn't have taken much effort. So, you know, this is something that happens in rewrites. It's a really bad idea for a series like this to write your episodes as you go because things like this happen and it looks like it was a last second thought. Like, oh, um, you know what? We didn't really set up Zoya wanting to become a good guy. So what should we do? Well, I got an idea. Let's say that she has family in Nova Kribirsk and that's why she turns on the Darkling. So how can we make sure that information comes out? I mean, we should have mentioned it in the earlier episodes, but we didn't. So you know what? Let's just have her talking randomly with this other heart render and being like, uh, yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is visit my aunt. It felt last second and sloppy. And I just don't appreciate that. You could have put this in much sooner. This could have been in episode one. We could have seen her on the ship and she could have, you know, maybe um, Alina could have been talking to somebody or maybe when she was talking to to uh, Mal when they're in the tent and he comes to steal the grapes, you know, she could talk about, he could be like, you know, why are you going over or something like that? I don't know. And she could have been like, because I got family there. Just that little hint, you know, it could be part of her flirting with him, you know, that she feels like she has a, this affinity for the people in Ravka. And I don't know, it just would have been nice if we had seen this set up earlier because right now it feels like a last second change that they just, uh, let's say she has family there. Okay. No, no. Bad. Oh yeah. Also the heart render indicates to Zoya that the Darkling is up to something. I, it, it's too much. Like it, we didn't need to have a hint that the Darkling wasn't going on this trip to destroy the fold. It was nice that it's a surprise that he's decided not to just like, you know, that his, he's not going to destroy the fold in this trip. He's actually using it to kind of help him uh, uh, acquire power, you know, threatening the other countries and stuff. I would have liked that. And no, the heart, other heart renders like, oh, uh, you know, I was told to tell you to stop the skiff before we get to Nova Kribirsk's harbor. And she's like, uh, why did the Darkling tell you he's got some sort of plan? And he's like, uh, you know, doesn't really tell her anything. And it's just telegraphing to the audience. The Darkling is up to something and it's not destroy the fold. It is nice to have that surprise that he's not going to destroy the fold, that he's going to use it as a power move. It, you just didn't need to do this. Okay, so now some of the ridiculousness begins. Kerrigan has her create the tunnel and then they get to the end and you can see uh, the General Zlatan and his uh, his dude <laughs> there. And okay, first of all, the dude calls her the Sun Queen, which I have not heard this term used at all. It seemed a little out of place because they've called her the Sun Summoner and they've called her the Saint before, but not the Sun Queen. So I'm wondering what's that about? And I'm thinking we're gonna see more of this. I sort of wonder, sort of wonder if there's a group of people at this point who want, because she's the saint, to be the queen now. 
But anyway, so Kurgan extends the fold and it goes off into uh, uh, Novokrebirsk. And then Alina quickly like blasts as much of it away as she can. And you can see that there's been a bunch of destruction. Obviously Zlatan is gone, which what a shame. He was kind of a good looking guy. So no more General Zlatan, I'm guessing. I mean, unless he got away, I guess he could have, but it sort of looked like he didn't get away. <laughs> In the book, we actually see a mother and child get killed. Um, which is nice. That's, I mean, it's nice that it's a scary thing. Like we see this horrible thing that has happened and it feels very dangerous. In this case, we saw no death except for somebody getting carried off in the distance, but we don't know who it is. Could be General Zlatan, maybe not. We don't know. And then Mal to the rescue. <laughs> Mal comes shooting in and immediately gets stopped by Ivan. So... What was Mal's plan? I, I don't know. It was a desperate move, but I get it. He was trying to save her, but why isn't he shooting people in the face instead of he's shooting them in the chest, which Kef does, you know, um, that's like Kevlar. That's a big <laughs> Kef to Kevlar. Wow. I never put that together. That is bulletproof. It's not going to help if you shoot him in the chest. You have to shoot them in the face. And of course he doesn't. And this is why he gets stopped immediately by Ivan. Then at one point, uh, Ivan turns and kills all of the ambassadors. Now that I did not understand at all. Why kill them? Why not make them pass out? Now that you've killed them, you've made yourself an enemy of all those countries. So even if Kerrigan is like, oh, I'm gonna get more ambassadors and talk to them. Well, first of all, they're gonna be more reluctant to go with him anywhere because <laughs> the last guys who went with you died and now we don't wanna go and die. So they're gonna be reluctant to send somebody with him because he goes, oh, I guess I'll have to make that speech again. I, I was very disappointed in the writing of the dialogue in this episode for a lot of reasons. There were things that were being said that didn't quite make sense. Gosh, I wish I could go over all of them, but I would be here for as long as the period of the episode <laughs> to go over all of them. There were things that the crows were saying that didn't make sense. There were things that Kerrigan was saying that didn't make sense. It just went on and on. There are just things that uh, I'm, you know what? I, maybe I am mostly disappointed in this episode. I think because I was, I felt like they did such a good job with most of the episodes leading up to here. I was expecting that they're going to punch real hard at the end. It's going to be so good because they've shown us that they can do really good stuff. And that means the ending is going to be awesome because it's actually a good end. This is a good end to this story, at least for a book one, you know, and then there'll be a continuation after. It's a good job. I think this is, everything makes sense. Everything comes together at the end, but yeah. So at this point then, Ivan has killed all of the ambassadors and he's controlling Mal. Then Jesper, did I mix this up? Jesper comes in, no, this is at this point. Jesper comes in and shoots Ivan. And then Ivan and Jesper are kind of having this, you know, back and forth. And of course, Jesper's not shooting him in the face, which he should. And he even comments on that. He goes, can't, you know, still can't shoot a pretty face. You're about to die. So earlier he was talking about how Inej won't kill anybody. She's killed more people than Jesper has at this point, I believe. I haven't seen Jesper kill anybody. He just almost does and then doesn't. Is this like a complex with him that he refuses to kill anybody? Did he know that the Kefta is bulletproof? I, I don't know. This is weird. Like I did. So Ivan's clearly not dead. At least he better not be because then why didn't Jesper just shoot him in the face? I don't know. Anyway, um, and then Kaz saves Jesper because he sees Kirigan forming the cut to go after Jesper and he pushes Jesper out of the way. Then they're safe. Hooray. And that's when Inej comes in and hurls a dagger at, at General Kirigan. And I have to say, I really like it when something that makes perfect sense happens and it wasn't expected. Like, uh, it, it would be really obvious in this case for Elena to go after Kerrigan and somehow stop him or for Mal to do it because he came right after him. You don't expect the, for lack of a better term, the lackey. <laughs> you know, Inej is not a leader. She's just the knife in the crows. And she's the one who goes after Kerrigan and actually gets him. And I like that a lot. I also like that it it didn't kill him. So he's clearly got some sort of a strength other than just being, you know, long lived, he's able to sustain a lot of injury as well. And then we see uh, Kaz rescues Inej. I mean, I'm gonna get more into the crows later, but we see Kaz, you know, rescues Inej and then everybody's engulfed in darkness. And that is when Alina takes up Inej's knife 
that had stabbed, uh, I think it's the same one that had stabbed Kerrigan and she uses it to puncture out his, um, his, you know, his piece of the bone. What I don't like is her speech where she describes how she realizes that she is a person of, you know, I have this power, I have the power of the stag. I don't like this. She says, you can't possess what wasn't given to you. The stag chose me and so its power is mine. And that's what gives her, you know, that is not as good as my mercy is what gave the power of the stag to me. See, in this case, her power was entirely dependent on the actions of the stag. The stag chose her, and so she now owns, you know, it's it's now hers. But I like that in the book, she earned that power. She had the chance to kill it and didn't. And I know that happened in the show too. I just don't understand why they didn't have that be her reason at this point in the in the show too. It's more powerful that her actions gave her this special power as opposed to, I just happen to be the one that the stag chose, you know, no, it's not as powerful as her, um, as what, what the, the writer did in the book. So I don't think that was a good choice there. I think that it would have been better if Inej, or not Inej, I like Inej, if Alina, uh, acquired her power because of her merits as opposed to just being handed it. Okay. And then I didn't get this. How is it that she um, <laughs> absorbed the antlers? Is this part of her power? She suddenly has control over body parts now too? I found this very, very strange. So I don't understand how her power is supposed to include this. Her thing is about light, I thought. So how is it also about controlling her body? This seems like a heart render thing or what do you call a fabricator or I don't know, you know, one of the Grisha who can control your body feels like it should be their power exclusively. So I don't understand how she suddenly was able to do this. I think the only reason that the show did it is because they didn't want to have to put prosthetic antlers on her collarbone every time that she's, you know, in a scene. I, I get that that's, you know, a big issue. Would have been kind of neat though, if they're like, you know what, we got to figure out a way to get this gone. And then she and Mal find a way to file it down or something, or maybe her and Inej. That would have been nice if it was her and Inej, um, you know, filing down the antlers because that, she, you know, Inej has some experience with knives. And so maybe this is something that she, you know, she works with files and stuff to keep her, well, I guess you would use like a whetstone or something for knives. But anyway, you get the idea. It would have been interesting to see this being something she has to deal with in the next season. Like, I got to get rid of these because they're too conspicuous. Instead, they decided to break the rules of the world, which is she's supposed to be in control of light. Oh, if I miss something, please let me know. Okay, then the ridiculousness continues with Mal shoving Kerrigan overboard. And this is now how Mal ends up overboard with Kerrigan and they have a fight and it just felt melodramatic at this point. This was not in the book at all. As a matter of fact, Mal is not invo involved in the fight at all. He's just overboard the whole time because Ivan shoved him overboard and you know, the, he's in the darkness and you can hear him screaming and Alina has to jump overboard to be with him. In this case, that's not what happens at all. He Mal grabs the Kerrigan and they go overboard and they're having a fist fight type of thing. And then suddenly Mal has a pistol because, you know, there was one that was on the ground earlier and he he starts shooting at Kerrigan, but again, not shooting him in the face. I mean, you're supposed to be a hunter. How hard is it to shoot a guy in the face? But because there were things like this, now I, I get it. Okay, we can have for the sake of drama doing this, but drama without a purpose other than to just be dramatic, feels cheap. And this felt cheap to me. They tried to save it with Mal saying, you know, I don't have to, you know, kill you. Your own past is going to do that for me. And then the Volker comes and snags, um, snags Kerrigan. For some reason, it didn't come and snag Mal, which didn't make sense. It just felt like they wanted this moment. This is how they wanted to do it. It would have been more interesting if maybe, maybe you see the Volker, like a whole flock of them coming for Mal and uh, uh, Kerrigan and Alina, you know, extends the light to encompass just Mal, but not Kerrigan. I would have liked that. And so Mal can just stand there looking through this barrier and watching Kerrigan getting torn up. That would have been cool. I would have liked that. That would have been good. But then you couldn't have Alina being knocked out. And again, for for drama reasons, Ivan attacks Alina and almost kills her. He should have known he's not supposed to kill her. I mean, 
I don't understand why suddenly Ivan decides to start killing people when clearly that's not what General Kerrigan wants. I mean, he seemed to be okay with him killing the ambassadors, but he wasn't asked to do that. So I'm not really sure why that happened. If we're trying to portray Ivan as being this cold hearted killer, it just doesn't feel right for some reason. I'm trying to, maybe I, I could think about this more and figure out why it doesn't feel right, but it just doesn't. Anyway, but he goes after Alina, which really makes no sense. Like he should know Kirgan does not want Alina dead. He didn't want Mal dead. Of course he doesn't want Alina dead. So this didn't make sense. Anyway, so yeah, Mal watches General Kerrigan get taken away by a Volcra, and for some reason he doesn't get taken away. Then he climbs back up into the boat, and he's trying to wake up Alina, please wake up, you know, and she does wake up, and then she saves everybody, and huzzah, they're all safe again. Okay, at this point, some weirdness happens. <laughs> Inej and Alina are talking, I really like that, but they're talking as if they haven't really met before. I guess they kind of didn't have much to talk, time to talk before, but, um, I didn't like this. I didn't like that Alina like hands her a knife. You know, I'm sorry, you know, I couldn't hold on to yours, you know, but here's mine. When was the, when did we see this knife? I would have liked to have seen that this was like something that she had as a possession that was given to her. And maybe she learned how to fight with it. Like maybe we should have had more scenes with her training with, um, gosh, I can't remember the name of the guy. He's more in the book. In the book, we see her training with the, um, the fight instructor, who the guy who's also Shu Han. And um, it would have been cool if like this was what she had to learn was how to knife fight. And she has this knife and she hands it to Aline, or to Inej. And Inej, strangely, goes, I'll know just what to name it. She names her knives? That What? <laughs> this is new information. Again, don't bring up something new like this. And like it's supposed to mean something to us when you, you're just introducing it for the first time right here. Here's how you could have fixed this. You could have had all the way from the very beginning, whenever she takes out her knives and she's cleaning them or focusing on them or that she really loves her knives and she names them. We could have names for all of them. And, and this is why she always uh, so carefully goes back to try to retrieve them and why it would be so cool if the first time, you know, when she kills the guy, the heart render guy who was after Kaz when they were back in the little palace, it would have been really cool if like she didn't retrieve that knife and she brings up at some point that, you know, I had to leave, you know, the whatever name she gave to it, you know, uh, <laughs> Vladimir, <laughs> I had to leave Vladimir, you know, behind or whatever she would name. Okay, I guess she's, she's what? She's not Zemini. She's um, Suli. She'd give him a Suli name, give the knife a Suli name, which would have been cool. You know, then it's like it, it meant something not just that she killed somebody, but also that she left a knife behind that she cares about. And then we get to this point and we see her throwing her knives. First of all, she's chucking her knives at the Volcra and it's not doing anything. I'm like, stop throwing your knives at them. <laughs> like, use them if you absolutely must. Why didn't she just go, I don't know, back under the ship? I, it was a little weird, but I guess, you know, she's already out there. She's trying to defend Alina. Okay, whatever. But she, she's all she's got her knives. It's not very useful. Um, but uh, yeah, her saying, I'm, I know just what to name it, just felt weird. Felt like, why? She, has, she doesn't name her knives. We haven't seen this being a thing for her, so it just felt odd. Okay, then Kaz tells Alina, you know, you're very, you are a very valuable person. And Alina hands him her hairpiece, the, the thing that she was, I think it was a hairpiece, that she was wearing around her, behind her head and it's gemstones. And she's like, so are these, these are valuable also. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, she's like, I'm, I will give this to you as payment for not telling anybody that you know who we are, you know, like for his silence. And he's like, okay, deal and shakes her hand. So he's missing out on the 1 million Kruger. And now you've got the problem of Dreesen, Dreesden, whatever that guy. And also uh, Pekka are both going to be really ticked off at him. And he needs money to protect himself and the and all of them and also to set Inej free. And so he's like, well, I'm going to use one of the gemstones on this thing to set Inej free. And Inej is like, yeah, that'll be great. I'm going to watch, you know, Helene's face. But he said, I saw this on one of the portraits of a queen in the little palace. Like he recognizes that these are the gemstones of, of royalty. Again, this feels like a last second thing. Like they didn't set this up. Here's what you could have done to fix this. You could have had, when he's in the little palace, him pausing and noticing a portrait of a queen in the little palace 
and seeing that she is wearing this hairpiece and then maybe noticing Alina wearing it at the party, something, something like that, you know, or maybe even making a comment to Inej or Inej making a comment to him going like, geez, all these women are wearing jewels and like just one of those would be enough to set me free. Something like that. So that it doesn't feel like a last second add in in the last episode. Just mention it earlier. This is what you do in rewrites. And this is why you don't write an episode and then film it and then think, okay, now we filmed that one. I guess I better start on the next one. No, write them all. Figure out what is going to need to be set up properly and insert as you go, because then it feels valuable. Then you can go back and watch this show a second time and go, oh, Kaz did notice that portrait. And wow, and Nej totally mentioned how just one gemstone off of, you know, one of these rich ladies would have been enough to set her free. Like that, that would have been good. Instead, you add it in at the last seconds. It, it feels like a like it was just an afterthought. Okay. Here is an example of some of the dialogue that made zero sense to me. When Alina, first of all, Alina takes her dress and chucks it into the fire. And I'm like, that was probably worth money. Like, no. <laughs> I, I didn't catch that this golden dress that she's wearing is actually a kefta. So if it is, I would have liked to have had some revelation. This is a golden kefta just for you, Alina, because he chucks it in the fire and he goes, you know, I didn't expect it to burn just like I didn't expect General Kerrigan to be able to die, you know, or something like that. He basically says, you know, what does he say? I didn't expect it to burn at all, um, but but it can be destroyed in the end, just like, you know, General Kerrigan. It felt like the whole reason that they burned the Kefta was so that he could have this line where he's like, I didn't expect it to be able to burn, just like I didn't expect that the General Kerrigan could die. And of course, he's still alive. This just felt... This felt kind of juvenile compared to what we've had up till now. And we've had little hints that it's kind of, you know, it, it's got the juvenility um, being in there as well. But I didn't expect it for the final episode where you expect the greatest amount of effort. Like, go out strong. Don't go out weak. And this just felt like, huh? It felt like... Eh. I'm, I'm a little more than just a little disappointed in this last episode. Okay, um, I think, gosh, is it time to talk about the other stories? I've talked a lot about the Alina story. It's all bled and melded together at this point, with the exception of the Nina and Matthias story. It, they kind of tried to hook it at the end, like, ha! Ah! And at that point, I'm just going, all that for this? You really didn't have to have that. But, okay. Kaz trusts Mal awfully quickly. He immediately like, oh, well, you're not with them. I guess you're with us. I don't see Kaz as being the trusting type. I would have liked to have seen Inej in immediately latching onto him and going, I can tell this is somebody who cares about Alina. Like she would have that perceptiveness about her. And yeah, I know that they're like, okay, Kaz is a perceptive person too. But Inej is thinking a lot about Alina in this whole situation. It's the whole reason she goes up onto the deck. So I would have liked to her, for her to have seen something in Mal that tells her, this is a person who is here specifically for Alina. And so I trust him. And so I would like, there's no trust between Mal and those guys. Uh, Mal and, and, the, and Kaz and, and Jesper, perhaps Jesper doesn't know what to think. But Inej immediately sides with Mal. And I like that she does go with Mal, even though I think Mal's a total idiot for deciding to go up there alone. I get that he was like desperate or whatever, but come on, Kaz was totally right. They are completely outnumbered and outpowered by the Grisha and stuff that are up there. They should wait until they're on the other side and the situation is calm and they can just figure out some sneaky way to get Alina out of there. What's wrong with that? I don't know why that, that seemed like something Mal couldn't do. I mean... You can't wait an hour. He's not going to kill Alina. And you're not in the situation you were in the book, which is prisoner who then gets chucked overboard. They don't even know you're there. So he should have been more patient and waited. And Inej, anyway, so we'll, we just have to go with what the show did. So he goes, Inej goes off with him, which I liked. And somehow Inej immediately knows that Zoe, first of all, immediately knows Zoya's name. And I, I guess I could pick up on that she overheard her saying that her name was Zoya or somebody calling her Zoya. And so she calls her Zoya. But it's like, did she know this person? As far as we know, they lived on different sides of the fold. So it was weird that Inej suddenly starts calling Zoya Zoya. Um, but uh, I did like that 
she seemed to catch that Zoya and the heart render were not on the same side. And Zoya was on the side that the Inej wants to be on. So she goes and holds back the heart render and then has a fight with him. So Zoya can work on getting the skiff moving again. I like that. Um, but again, Zoya's transformation, not very well led up to at this point. Gosh, ugh. I really am so much more disappointed in this episode than I think I expected. I think, I think I just wanted it to be more clean than it was. <sighs> I'm still going to watch season two and I am going to be reading Six of Crows and um, the second book, The Siege of, Siege of Storms. And so I'm going to need people to help me figure out which chapters go with this. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to have to watch because it's been really difficult to get, you know, what are the chapters that I need to read that I think are going to be in the next episode. So if you guys are savvy on which which chapters I need to read before I watch episodes, so that way I can continue to go back and forth between show and book, let me know. Um, yeah, then it, it got really convenient that at the very end, they're all... I didn't know why they're all in the boat together. Why is Kaz and Jesper and uh, Inej on this boat pretending like they don't know Mal and Alina? I mean, they just walked away together, right? I mean, they were all at that campfire and then they're all like, I guess we're gonna go our separate ways, but then they all decide they're gonna get on the same boat together, but pretend that they don't know each other. I mean, it's a little odd. I don't feel like it would have given them away if they just like, you know, yeah, we still know these people, but uh, whatever. Okay, that's fine. We'll just go with what they decided to do. Would have maybe liked a reason why they felt like they had to keep, you know, their plan. You know, we're going to pretend we don't know each other. That would have been a bit nice. And now we have to talk about, <laughs> got to talk about Nina. <laughs> I got some problems with the Nina story. <laughs> um, so first of all, I guess they're in love. They've decided that they're in love. So the last time that we saw them, Matthias took off his coat and put it around Inej. They're not, in, oh my gosh, I can't believe I called her Inej, around Nina. And I guess that means that they love each other because now they're going, where are we gonna go? Where can we go that we can just be ourselves? And I'm going, oh, you guys aren't really a couple. Why are you having this discussion? But apparently they are a couple and they've decided to it wasn't clear what their situation is because he was like, well, I guess I'll just go away in the night. And she's like, well, where could we go where we could be together? And I'm like, you guys aren't on the same page. <laughs> Clearly they don't know what's going on with each other. And I don't think the writers knew either. They go downstairs and there is a guy from, I think he's from Ketterdam and he is hunting down slavers. And I would have, again, liked to have had more hints leading up to this episode that there are bounties out on slave people, you know, people who go out and hunt down other people for slavery. That would have been nice. That way you get to this point and you're not like, oh, they just threw this together for, you know, the last minute thing of the episode. The one thing I did like is that Fedor shows up. Hooray, Button Boy is back. But, you know, everything else in the Nina story, the Nina and, and Matthias story just didn't, it felt like, why is this here? Because hooking them up at the end, hooking up Nina with the crows at the very end, that wasn't enough. I just didn't feel that. I, I wasn't like, oh good, now they're gonna get together. I was going, that's it? We had all this stuff going on with Nina and Matthias so that we could get to, we need a heart render and going, oh, I guess they're going to be, you know, teaming up in the future. No. No, we didn't need that. You know what would have been neat is if we saw them having this discussion and then this character we don't recognize turns around and asks them this question, you know, about, is it true about, you know, Nova Krabirsk or about the, the Sun Summoner, is she dead or whatever, something like that. And then the people in the, the book, or not the people in the book, the people who have read the book, who I mean, I'm assuming that they know that this is how they all teamed up together or something. They can get hints that this is a person. It could be like a teaser for the next episode for like people who know who she is. You know, we could even, even have had a time where Mal goes down, you know, he's down in the brig or whatever. Is it Mal? Somebody could be downstairs and overhear this conversation a little bit uh, that, that, um, that Nina is having with 
m with Matthias and it looks like they're having an argument or something, you could have had that be like a background thing, like a teaser just for the people who have read this. Or even if they haven't, like it would be enough of a hint that they're going, hey, is, is that Nina and Matthias? That would have been so much better. Instead, you had a bunch of stuff that felt like not very cleverly written um, build up to a relationship and a, uh, uh, and when I say relationship, I mean um, the two of them being together, just so you could have this other relationship happen, the Nina hooking up with the crows right at the end. No, I, I'm, be I'm not being very articulate. I'm just annoyed. I'm annoyed that so much time was spent on something that was very unsatisfying, felt very juvenile in comparison to the other stories, just for this. Okay, what stuff did I actually like about this episode? So I did like that Kaz actually saves both Inej and um, uh, Jesper at different points here. It didn't quite make sense that he was able to do some of these things. But, you know, it felt a little bit like, oh, okay, now he comes to Inej's rescue. You know, that's the reason why he left the under the boat part is to go and save his crew. I like that. But at the same time, he didn't suffer any consequences for this. I maybe would have liked to have seen him get injured because he went out to save Inej and Kaz. And then Inej and, or not Kaz, uh, Jesper. Then Inej and Jesper can hopefully look back on him as being like, he was right. We should have just stayed underground or under the boat until the end. You know, maybe we should listen to him. I don't know. The, the, it felt like... You know what fan service is? It felt a little bit like fan service. It felt like we were seeing something that we've all wanted to see. We've all wanted to see Kaz come to the rescue of Inej. And so he did. And we've all wanted to see Kaz somehow, you know, what is the relationship between him and Jesper? And, and I, I don't know. If Jesper's supposed to be a sharpshooter, shouldn't he have very good eyesight and predictability and be quick thinking like this? I, it was just weird that he didn't notice I guess, okay, wait, wait, wait. It does make sense that Jesper didn't know that the um, the Darkling can do the cut thing and, and Kaz did know because he faced off against the Darkling before. But at the same time, I, it was like so little to save this, this moment here. Okay, overall, I do enjoy this series. I feel like I have been disappointed a bit um, because it did such a good job with the earlier episodes in improving this text, improving this story and these characters. And we just didn't get that at the end of the series. I'm hoping that they fix some stuff for season two, because there's a lot going on here. Like, does Jesper have a thing against killing people? He hasn't killed no anybody. Inej, who has vocally expressed that she's against killing, has done it at least twice now. So I'd like some answers. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'll be starting on uh, season two immediately, basically. Um, and I'll be reading the book, uh, both of the books along with it. But yeah, if you know which chapters I need to read for each episode out of both the Six of Crows book and the, um, the Siege of Storms books, please tell me about it in the comments. <laughs> tell me which chapters I need to read for each episode because it's tough for me to guess on my own. And um, my sister is having a baby, so I've, she's not able to help me anymore. <laughs> so anyway, um, if um, you enjoy these reviews, let me know about it in the comments. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you'd like to support the channel uh, financially, look at my Patreon or Ko-fi. And uh, I guess that's it. Yeah, be good to yourself.